So we turn to Deuteronomy. Um, if you wanted the notes, um, there's, a, there's some notes at the back if, uh, if you're here at church and you want them. Um, Natalie could pass them along. They're on the, the desk there. Otherwise, um, I emailed them earlier today, so they'll be in your inbox if you want to follow through on the notes. So what's the first page? Give some detail on Deuteronomy. Actually, I'm going to start on the second page and start the review, which might be more helpful, especially for those who haven't been with us. So we've been looking at how Scripture unfolds from the beginning, and we'll get to the end eventually. But we started, of course, with <clears throat> Genesis. And in that, the Creator makes all things good, but man falls. And then the Lord sets all restoration in motion through the different covenants that he has. And this is all about the good God and his glory, seeking to reveal his glory through the things that he has created and through a people that he sets apart for himself. Then in Exodus, God reveals his glory through the redemption of that people that he set apart. Exodus is very much about God's glory. And then we get to Leviticus, having taken his people out of Exodus, uh, sorry, out of slavery in Egypt through the Exodus, God then in Leviticus instructs his people to be holy that he might walk with them. Again, this all fits together as you go from Genesis to Exodus to Leviticus, the Lord is showing forth his glory, firstly in creation and then in setting apart a people for himself and then taking them out of slavery in Egypt, God always revealing his glory, revealing his glory in his mighty power through the plagues, but also in setting apart this people, looking after this people, seeing that they defeat their enemies. It's all about him. And so Leviticus, they are preparing more and more to be refined, to be set apart as holy, to do things God's way. And then in Numbers, uh, the people rebel against God. They're just about to enter the promised land and they lack faith in him. And so God refines the nation, takes them through the wilderness for 40 years. And that book, Numbers, is very much about refining of the people. And then the Lord brings them back to where they were, the edge of the promised land again. The old generation that didn't have faith has gone and now there is a new generation. And here in Deuteronomy then, they stand on the verge of the promised land, entering into all the promises that the Lord had given them in the promised land and being a people set apart for him. But this generation hasn't heard the word of God in, in the, the Ten Commandments. They haven't heard the, the depth of the law. So Moses stands on the edge of the promised land with them, up a mountain, and proclaims to them this law. And so that's where we come in. So looking at the book of Deuteronomy, the Hebrew name, as we've said before, that the Hebrew names of the books of the, the Old Testament use the, the first few words in Hebrew of, of the scroll as it unrolls. So they unroll the scroll and they read the first few words and that's how they give them the book its name. So for this book, it's called my mind's gone blank. Eleha Devarim. I'm not going to test you all on that, so don't worry. Eleha Devarim. But what, it, what does it mean? If you look at Deuteronomy 1, 1, it says, these are the words Moses spoke to all Israel. So it simply means these are the words. So for the Hebrew, for the Israelite, the book of Deuteronomy is called these are the words. Simple as that. Eleha Devarim. The Greek word is Deuteronomion. Deuteronomion. And you can see where we get our name Deuteronomy from. Uh, it simply means second law because they take that name because when you look at the book, Moses is talking law. He's restating the law, having given it earlier in Exodus for the first generation. Now in Deuteronomy, he's stating the law a second time. And that's why we have the name Deuteronomy, second law. It's not a second law. It's just saying it again to a new generation of people. So the purpose of the book of generation is God restating the law 
to a new generation of Israelites through Moses, reminding them of the promise made and the responsibilities given in preparation for entering the land. The author of the book is Moses. He wrote the first five books of the Bible, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. Those five books, sometimes called the Pentateuch, are also called the Torah, which means law. And that's the main body of scripture for the, the Israelites. Uh, the law is the first and foremost. And then you have the writings and the prophets that come after. But we'll get to those later on. But the law is closed by Deuteronomy, if you like. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. So Moses wrote this during the final weeks before his death. If we skip ahead quickly to the very end of Deuteronomy, it tells us that uh, Moses wrote this law. Deuteronomy 34. Actually, maybe it's before that. So it's a bit before that. It's in chapter 31, verse 9. So Moses wrote down this law and gave it to the priests, the sons of Levi, who carried the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord. So Moses wrote down all of Deuteronomy right at the end of his life. And a couple of chapters later, we see he goes up a mountain, hands over to Joshua, and then the Lord takes him. He dies, not having entered the promised land. So we know that Moses wrote, wrote the words of this law. He wrote Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. And that would have been in approximately the year 1405 BC. Uh, we can trace that um, through extra biblical archaeology that matches uh, events that are described in Scripture. There are uh, inscriptions that say this king on this date did this, and it might mention King David or someone else in scripture. And so there are things that we can correlate with um, outside of the Bible uh, that show us that the Bible is historical. It's not merely mythology. Um, it connects. And if there's ever any contradiction between what scripture says and what people in history might say, what, what the his, historians might say, then time will always bear out and show that scripture is actually true. So, for example, for, for many years since the Enlightenment, enlightenment um, of the 17, 1800s, um, for many years they said, oh, David's not really a real king, is he? He's just a mythological figure. But actually since then, in the 1900s, there have been various archaeological finds that actually confirm what scripture says that david was a real king and that there's loads more we could go on about that but i'd rather focus on the words of scripture than archaeology interesting though it might be so that's the author and date moses final weeks before his de death in 1405 bc the outline of the book um We've mentioned before the suzerain vassal treaties. So in the ancient Near East of those days, there was this style of writing particular documents that were a legal agreement, if you like, between a superior king and a lesser king or prince or, or region. And the superior king would, um, would make these documents that... that solemnified the agreement between the big king and the little king and we see some of this going on with god the superior king and israel the the lesser people and in that regard it's it's laid out like this there are these different sections so Mo moses in this book of deuteronomy has three speeches and then an epilogue that kind of summarizes and describes moses legacy in the first speech, he gives these two aspects of this kind of lawsuit stru structure, as it's called, or covenant, or treaty. 
there's a historical setting given in chapter 1, verses 1 to 5, that says, this is how we got to this place. <clears throat> and then, so there's the historical setting given, but then there's the historical prologue that gives much more detail, that talks about what God has done for his people, bringing them out of Egypt and all of that. This is similarly seen in those uh, covenant suzerain vassal treaties, whatever you want to call them, between a greater king and a lesser king. They do exactly the same thing. So the people of the ancient Near East would be expecting this kind of language. It would help them to understand what's going to come next. So in that regard, what we see is the historical setting in chapter 1, verses 1 to 5, the historical prologue that gives all that detail about what God has done, in chapter 1 verse 6 to chapter 4 verse 49 and then in Moses second speech he gives general requirements of the people of God so God specifies this is what you need to do uh, in chapter 5 verse 1 to 11 32 uh, and then chapter 12 verse 1 to, to chapter 26 verse 9 give specific requirements in specific situations so the general stuff is more these are the principles the ten commandments are in there for example these are the principles the things that you the way you're to govern your life and then the specifics are things to do with slavery and and uh, uh, cleanliness and things like that and then in chapter 27 and 28 we get to the blessings and curses which say if you don't if you do do all that stuff that I've just laid out, then you will be blessed. And this is what the blessings look like. If you don't do all that stuff, then you'll be cursed. And these are all the bad things that will happen to you. And these go back to Leviticus and what Moses had said to the people back then. Uh, it all builds on this. Ultimately, if you're not faithful to the Lord, these bad things will happen. But if you are faithful, then these good things will happen. In Moses' third speech, in chapter 29 and 30, witnesses are given and the covenant is sealed. So uh, the Lord invokes like the, the creation around them to say that these stones will be the mountains, the heavens. They will be witnesses against you for uh, when you contravene these things, that the earth itself will be a witness against you. Uh, and then there's the epilogue at the end, which cleans up if you like or that's not the right word uh, brings to a close Moses's life describing the end of his life and passing on to Joshua so all of that to say the book of Deuteronomy is effectively a legal agreement between God as the superior and the people of Israel as the inferior and if they it describes how God has been good to them and what he's done for them throughout the years and then it goes on to what's expected of them. And then it goes on to what will happen if they do and what will happen if they don't keep those things. And then witnesses are presented, a bit like a courtroom setting. So that kind of document would have been expected in the ancient Near East of those times. So key scriptures then that are in the book of Deuteronomy. Uh, in chapter 5, the Ten Commandments are restated that we first see in Exodus 20. <clears throat> Excuse me. In Deuteronomy 18, there's a warning against witchcraft and false prophets. And there's the promise of this coming prophet who will be greater than Moses. Actually, that turns out to be Jesus. If we're not reading ahead to the end, as we get to Deuteronomy, we don't know that's Jesus. But actually, we, we do know because we've read to the end. Actually, that prophet greater than Moses is Jesus. And... Uh, Gone, my mind's gone blank a second, whether it's Matthew or Luke, or maybe both of them, that talk specifically about how Jesus fulfills this kind of terminology about being the prophet greater than Moses that was, prophet, that was promised. In Deuteronomy 27 and 28, there's the curses and blessings that are repeated from Leviticus. Uh, specific verses, chapter 4, verse 2. You shall not add to the word that I command you, nor take away from it. This confirms for us that this is scripture. Uh, we've seen this idea before. We discussed it, how God's word comes through God's prophets. They have this formula for saying, thus says the Lord. And you know that only 
God, God's word can only come from the one who is appointed by God and says, thus says the Lord. And so you might say, well, in that case, how does God's word go beyond Je Genesis to Deuteronomy? Well, there's that clear handover from God's man to God's man, from Moses to Joshua. And in the middle of that, the end of Deuteronomy, in that handover, the Lord affirms Joshua as the person to take over. And so God's word continues, the thus says the Lord, through Joshua. And we'll see that crop up again and again through the Old Testament, through the prophets, until we get to the New Testament. So that's... Uh, Chapter 4, verse 2. Chapter 6, verse 4 to 9 are probably, I don't know, some of the most well-known words of Scripture. Um, Hear, O Israel, the Lord your God, the Lord is one. Um, even today, devout Jews, serious Jews will read that um, several times a day. Um, and it... Uh, it states various things, as we'll, we'll unpack that in a little when we get to it. Chapter 13, verses 1 to 5, are tests and consequences for a false prophet, uh, what to look for for those who are not from God. Chapter 17, verses 14 to 20, talks about laws for future kings. So Israel, at this point, didn't have a king. And later on, we get the impression that you could think, well, didn't this take the Lord by surprise, that all of a sudden the Israelites want a king? when they'd had a prophet leading them so far. But this clarifies for us, Deuteronomy 17, that the Lord always saw that the Israelites would have a king. It's just that they wanted a king of their own making. They wanted a king that was like the kings of the ancient Near East, not the king that God sought. But here in Deuteronomy 17, where the law is given, laws for future kings are given. Things, well, specifically, they, the Lord forbade them for accumulating. How there's one, one guy that I listened to on this who called it. He made it easy to remember. He says, "Gold, gals, and giddy up." So, gold, women, and horses are what the kings were not to pursue. But as we read about the lives of just David and Solomon, we know that that's very much what they do, and that was to their detriment. Um, chapter eighteen. Verses 18 and 19, a prophet like Moses is coming. Chapter 24, verses 1 to 4, the regulation of divorce and marriage. And chapter 29, verse 29, I think that's a really important verse to remember. The secret things belong to the Lord our God, but the things revealed belong to us. So on the one hand, you know, don't worry if you don't understand things because the secret things belong to the Lord. A lot of people stop there. You know, well, we don't understand that. Let's not argue about it. The secret things belong to the Lord. But the things revealed belong to us. And I think that says that we shouldn't just shrug our shoulders and go, oh, well, don't understand. God has revealed some things to us. And so we should seek and strive to actually understand those things. They belong to us. But we need to hold those things in balance. Some things the Lord has not revealed to us. So speculation is not helpful. Chapter 32, verse 39, God is sovereign over life and death. So that's a quick run through. Uh, we're not going to go through all of that today. Don't worry. We're just going to go through Moses's first speech and maybe second speech. We'll see how far we get. So first, the historical setting in chapter one verses, actually, back up a stick, in introduction, the importance of Deuteronomy. Deuteronomy really builds on everything that's come so far. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, and Numbers. And Deuteronomy interprets Ex Exodus, Leviticus, and Numbers for us. If we look at Deuteronomy chapter 1, verse 5, 1 to 5 describes the historical setting, where they are at this moment in Moab, about to go into the promised land. Chapter, verse 5, east of the Jordan, in the territory of Moab, Moses began to expound this law, saying, what is this law? It's Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, and Numbers, because he hadn't yet written Deuteronomy. He expound, he was explaining this law. So 
here is a case for expository preaching, I would say. It shows Moses doing one of the first sermons, explaining the previous text that he'd already written. This exposition, if you like, this explanation of what had gone before, so effectively summarizing the Bible so far, if you like, Deuteronomy sets the scene and sets the foundation for the future prophets. Because all the future prophets to come are always pointing back to Deuteronomy. All of the major prophets, Isaiah and Jeremiah, and all of the minor prophets, um, all of the 12 minor prophets, they always point back to the law. What God's already told us to do, we should be doing this. So that makes Deuteronomy really, really important. Because all the prophets that come later are pointing back to Deuteronomy. So if we understand Deuteronomy, we already know something of what the later prophets are trying to point us back to. So it can be helpful to read Deuteronomy first before going to the later prophets. So that historical setting then in, um, in chapter 1, verses 1 to 5. He's ex Moses is explaining past revelation. Behind them is death and judgment of faithlessness in the wilderness. In front of them is the land of promise and blessing. There's a bit of deja vu going on here. Numbers 13 and Numbers 14 describe them being in exactly the same place, but not having the faith to go into the land. But here they are, about to go into the land in faithfulness. Then the historical prologue, if you like, uh, from this point to chapter 4, verse 49 to the end of chapter 4. This gives us the covenant context, the land of promise that they're about, to Abra they're about to enter, that was promised to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Um, the Lord in this section sets out, look, you get in this land, it's not about you, it's never about you, it's always been about me. The land belongs to me and I'm giving it to you. All you need to do is to be faithful. And this... Um, this part of the text really builds on Leviticus 25, verse 23, that the land belongs to Yahweh. It's up to Yahweh who he gives it to. So in these verses, um, Moses recounts the history, what the Lord has done for them, and their disobedience and the results of that disobedience, that it meant that they wandered the wilderness for 40 years. Chapter 4, verse 1, that word here, O Israel, that word here is Shema, um, here, it's often through Deuteronomy. Here, O Israel, here, O Israel, here, O Israel. The way that Hebrew word works is to hear is to obey. It's not just to hear passively what I'm saying, like a piece of music that's on in the background that you might hear but not really pay much attention to. This Hebrew word means listen up. It means hear. It means obey. Um, it's a strong exhortation listen up <clears throat> chapter 4 verse 3 Baal Peor is the background to all of this if you were with us in Leviticus you would remember that Baal Peor was a turning point for the Israelites where they were intermarrying with the Moabite women and so for that given that the Lord has said don't do that the Lord sends a plague upon the people and one of the guys, uh, Phineas, is so zealous for the Lord, he follows a guy into his tent who's taken a Moabite woman with him, and he spears them both. And the Lord commends this guy for that. At the same time, Aaron intercedes for the people as God's priest and um, manages to stop this plague on behalf of the pe people. That's all happening at Baal Peor. A bad place. And here in Deuteronomy chapter 4, verse 3, Moses gives that background as if to say, Look, don't go there again. We're about to enter the promised land. Don't you guys mess it up this time. Let's be faithful. Love God fully. Yet even this introduction in chapter 4 predicts that they'll not be faithful. But if they repent, he will not forget and he'll save them again. So even as they're on the verge of entering the promised land, finally, in faithfulness, Moses knows, the Lord knows, they're going to mess it up again. But still, the Lord gives them the promised land, and he gives them the promise that when they do mess it up, they'll go into exile, but they'll come back. None of that is a surprise to the Lord. 
just a note about the historicity, if you like, of all of this and uh, what people think about the chronology of the Bible, the order that it was written in. Because this predicts things of the future, many modern scholars cannot accept that it was written earlier because they say, well, look, they, they have the assumption that prophecy can't exist. People can't tell the future. So they say, therefore, Deuteronomy must have been written hundreds of years later um, after the exile all happened. But no, we believe God's word and we know that he does predict what comes to pass. And so we can have faith that Deuteronomy was written earlier on in the 1400s BC. So all of that, the historical prologue to chapter 5 of Deuteronomy tells us that the unique God of creation is revealing himself through the people he has called. Moses' second speech gives the general requirements on the people and the specific requirements on the people. Uh, he restates the Ten Commandments and then explains in chapter 6, verse 1, this is the command. Let's look at that. Chapter 6, verse 1. Most English translations, several English translations actually say, these are the commands, decrees, and laws that the Lord your God directs me to teach you to observe in the land. The Hebrew actually says, this is the command, the decrees and the laws. So this is the command. There is one command here that's about to come up. He's not talking generally. He's talking specifically. There is one command. So what's he getting at? Well, it's verse 5. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength. And then he goes on to the rest, these commandments that I give you today. So let's go back. Chapter 6, verse 1. This is the command. The singular command is, verse 5, love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength. Then going back to chapter 6, verse 1, this is the command. We've already said what that command is. Decrees and laws that the Lord your God directed me to teach you. Then we go to chapter 6, verse 6. These commandments that I give you today. So there's this twofold thing going on. The first command, the primary thing that the Lord is given is, love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength. How do they do that? By keeping those commandments and decrees that I give you today to be upon your hearts, to impress them on your children, to talk about them when you sit at home and when you walk along the road, when you lie down and when you get up. In a nutshell, to love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength is to obey. To love is to obey. It's as simple as that. If someone doesn't obey, they don't love. So when your children disobey you, in that instant, they're showing you actually self-love, that they don't love you. Now, you know what kids are like. They waver, don't they? They're fickle. Aren't we? We're like that too. But the principle is right there, that to love is to obey. If we disobey, we show that we don't love. Uh, where do we get to? Yeah, this is the most important thing. It drives everything else through the rest of the book, loving God and obeying God. The Shema, what does that talk about? Uh, love the Lord, your, uh, hero Israel, the Lord, your God, the Lord is one. He's saying Yahweh is one Yahweh. He's not more than one. There is only one. Much as in Genesis 2, the husband and wife become one flesh. It's that same language. So just as a husband and wife become one in that respect, so Yahweh is one. Um, there is fellowship in that. There is um, plurality in that, much as we see in the Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, um, but there is only one Yahweh. So this tells us monotheism, there is one God. It tells us of holiness. He is one, he is separate, he is different, he is exclusive, he's unique, but there is fellowship. There's that one God in three persons. We can't spell that out from that one verse, but it, it kind of builds the platform for us to understand the Trinity as best we can as we go through the rest of Scripture. Chapter 6, verse 6 defines love, as I've said. 
we're to love God God's way, not the world's way. And that says to love him, to love his word, to be marked by his word. With Christ in the picture, we could simply say all of Christ in all of life. That's the way we're to be. We're be to, as his people, we're to be marked by God's word. Chapter 7, don't have distractions, drive out the nations. Chapter 8 talks about not forgetting, but to remember. To remember is to love as well as to obey. To forget is not to love. Chapter 9 resonates with what we heard on Sunday from Philippians. This is not about your righteousness, Israelites. I didn't pick you because you're good. It's because of my own righteousness, says the Lord. Sounds very New Testament. And again, when people say, oh, the Old Testament God was just in a bad mood. And by the New Testament, when Jesus came along, he chilled out. The message was always the same. We see that about God's righteousness being what's important. That's what we need. And we get it through Christ. It's not our own righteousness. Uh, chapter 10 talks about circumcising your hearts. The Lord here shows that it was never about mere obedience to outward symbols. Just by being physically circumcised didn't mean you could be saved as part of the people of God. You needed the Lord to do a work in your heart. And again, that's always been the case. And it's love that leads to obedience, not obedience that leads to love. We need the Lord to work on our hearts so that we can love him and then we'll be able to obey him. Finally, chapter 11 gives us a summary of the theological significance of loving and obeying and the covenant promises. Oof, there's a lot of stuff in there, isn't there? It's so rich, but it resonates so much with the New Testament that it shows us, I think, that that's a book we need to grasp and grapple with and understand. And when we do, it will help us with the rest, not only the Old Testament, but the New Testament. Um, it's one of the most quoted books in the New Testament, and Jesus himself quoted it many times. But let's leave it there for now. Um, next time, we'll continue with Moses' second speech. There's a little bit more to say, and his third speech, and then the epilogue that ends his life. Having spoken of so much, it may be dangerous to ask if there are any questions. Checking my emails to see if there's any questions coming in. No. Well, great. Um, if you think of something afterwards, do drop me an email. I'd love to, to look at that.